Over the next few episodes, we'll experience off-grid life in a remote corner of the Yukon. No electricity, running water or inside toilet. It was an incredible experience. We'll visit Car Cross, formerly known as Caribou Crossing, and home to 300 Car Cross Tagish First Nation residents. Take a ride with Alaskan Huskies on an amazing winter wonderland adventure and explore Whitehorse, the capital of the Yukon, and transportation hub during the Klondike Gold Rush in 1898. I hope you're going to enjoy it. Our adventure begins in Whitehorse, having connected via Vancouver. The capital of the Yukon Territory, it's probably most famous for its part in the Klondike Gold Rush of the 1890s. It was a popular route for thousands of gold prospectors descending on the Yukon to find their fortunes, passing through Whitehorse with many taking the River Yukon from here, heading for Dawson City, the epicentre of the Gold Rush. The SS Klondike was one of many stern wheelers that travelled the 900 mile round trip between the two cities and rests now on the bank beside the river just outside Whitehorse. A historic reminder of when the rivers were the highways. Right up to 1955 the river was the only way to get in and out of the Yukon. Stern wheelers would carry food supplies mining equipment and prospectors hopefully carrying the gold, silver and other minerals they discovered in a season. It would take three days to get to Dawson City and up to four days coming back, burning a tremendous amount of wood to power it through the river. There is a museum on board and when open, it has the decks set up to show an outbound trip to Dawson on the starboard side with all the equipment and food supplies and on the port side it's the return leg with the ore bags. It would have been so interesting to climb aboard. The paddle wheel is currently hidden for preservation work. It may well also be there to protect it through the harsh winter months. It can snow here from September to April. We were here in December, off season, so a number of the attractions are closed at this time of year. Bear that in mind if you're planning a trip. The population of the Yukon is around 43,000, with 75% choosing to live around Whitehorse. For the tourists, Main Street has retained a wooden fronted shops with a splash of colour and it's a charming place to walk. The railroad came to Whitehorse at the turn of the 20th century with the famous White Pass on Yukon route running from the port of Skagway in Alaska to Whitehorse. This route aided in getting the prospectors from Alaska to the gold fields. Sadly, services stopped here in 1982, but during the summer season, you can get a heritage narrow gauge train service between Carcross and Skagway. We'll be visiting Carcross in the next episode and learn more about this.
We needed provisions, as it was time for us to head out of the city and find our off-grid log cabin. Yeah. The next few days were going to be pretty different to anything we'd experienced before. We were heading about an hour's drive south of Whitehorse to a remote location on the River Wheaton. The sun never really gets above the mountains at this time of year, so the scenery is always this beautiful bluey white. The main road conditions surprised us. They are obviously well versed in keeping the important routes open. Make sure your hire car has winter tyres. You'd expect this, but it's not always a given, as we found out later in our trip collecting a car in Calgary. Budget Rent-A-Car had a great deal for us at £324 for a week for this Ford SUV. Coming off the main road, the last 19 kilometres were on snow-packed and ice roads. It was just magical. Whilst only an hour from proper civilization, having not passed a single car in the last stretch, we started to get the sense of the remoteness and how you could easily become snowed in with just one storm. We're almost there, this wonderful tree-lined drive taking us off-grid to the river's edge. Finally, we can see the chimney smoke from our cabin. The Wheaton River Wilderness Retreat has a number of types of accommodation, but we picked the remote log cabin, a 10 minute hike away from the main property. Greeted by some four-legged friends and our host to help us sledge our provisions and belongings to our winter wonderland. So uh, this is our little fire pit, but we won't be having any fires. It's uh, a wee bit cold for that. You can hear the river, but you can't really see it. It's the river Wheaton. And if I come over here, you'll just about be able to see it actually flowing through. There we go, look, you can just see it there. A 
little bit of a snowstorm going through. We're going to have a couple of centimetres of snow by the looks of it. There we are. This is where we are, our little camp. And you can just see our cabin. Smoke coming through the top there from our little fire. Daylight hours are about, uh, about seven hours. It gets light at about 10 o'clock in the morning and then about four or five o'clock it's dark and we'll stay that way until tomorrow morning and 10 o'clock. Welcome to our little log cabin. Come in, I'll show you around. You need to close that door though, because it's about minus 10 outside. <laughs> so, right here we are totally off grid. There's no electricity, no running water. Um, but we do have a few conveniences, mainly a propane powered oven. So that's got a kind of stove top and kind of actual oven bit. With the kitchen, we've got cupboards with cups, plates, all those kind of things. We do have a sink, but no tap, obviously. It's all these big blue water butts. And uh, Martina, our host, told us that they have their own well here. So this water is for washing, drinking, um, any other use you might have for it. We've got three of those, and over in this part of the living area, we've been supplied a big bowl, and that's for kind of washing our hands, washing faces. Kitchen table, four seats, and we've been having our dinners here, very comfortable. And next to that is probably the most important thing in the little cabin. It's our wood burner. It's quite big. Um, and outside we've got an unlimited supply of big fat logs to burn. When we first arrived, it was kind of cold in here and we've since figured out how to actually operate it. It's got two dials on the front which control the amount of air going into it. And we found that uh, the, the tighter the dials are turned, the slower the wood burns and the cooler it gets. But a good little indicator is our thermostat type thing here. So we found that just at the very beginning of the middle zone, the comfort zone, is the best. Having said that, it does get a little bit warm in here sometimes and the windows do open just to get a bit of that cold air in. This there's a pot full of hot water, sits on top of the stove and we've been using that for washing up and mixing with some of the water butt water to create a nice temperature for washing our face and hands in the mornings. Just off the main living area is our bedroom. Cute little room, uh, there's a double bed and just like a chest of drawers and that kind of thing, nice and simple. But we also have a window overlooking the mountain and the forest that we're surrounded by. 
and up these stairs, they're kind of steep, but there's another kind of little sitting area with a sofa bed if you've got more than two people. And again, views out over the the forest and the river that is actually frozen over right now, but would normally be flowing straight outside the house. So that's about it for inside the log cabin, but let's go have a look around outside. So immediately outside, we've got a lovely little veranda, um, benches, all of the logs that we need for the fire. This is our fridge that we've been using. It's just a cool box. Uh, we stopped off at a supermarket in Whitehorse before we arrived and stocked up on a few bits because there's no restaurants around here. We're in the middle of nowhere. It's been a bit of a learning curve staying here. A lot of things aren't working like how we're used to, but it's been great fun. Uh, one thing you're probably thinking you haven't seen yet is the toilet. Let's take a walk and I'll show you. Round this way. <laughs> We're about 30 meters or so from the house now. And just up here is our outhouse. Inside the cabin, there's a little portable torch. Um, right now it's getting dark at about five o'clock in the evening and it doesn't get light again until about 10, 10.30 in the morning. So it's been useful when I see inside. There we are, just your classic drop toilet. It's our little front gate. We'll take you to see some more of the grounds. The local birds need some help during the winter months, so it was nice to see them being looked after. The retreat also keeps a donkey that we sadly never saw, but the chickens were in fine spirits in the shed. Minus 15 didn't seem to bother them at all. So that's the little sauna cabin. And uh, if you're staying here for a couple of nights, they will pop the sauna on for you but uh, it is so hot in the, in the log cabin that we don't need a sauna as well. Lighting our riverside fire, we settled in to watch the light disappear behind the mountains, with just the wood crackling disturbing our otherwise silence. Next time we'll take a beautiful drive along the Alaska Highway to Carcross, formerly Caribou Crossing, and the terminus of the White Pass and Yukon Railway. We'll learn about the importance of the Alaskan Husky during the Gold Rush, and be taking a winter wonderland sled ride to experience the power of these gorgeous animals. We hope to see you next time. <laughs>